From 1975 until 1979, Cambodia endured profound hardship. When the Khmer Rouge seized power in Phnom Penh, the capital, they labelled soldiers, civil servants, merchants, royalty, educated people, intellectuals and the middle class as enemies of the state and marked them for elimination. The rest of the population was forcibly resettled in rural areas where they were compelled to partake in agricultural and manual labour, all in accordance with the Cambodian Communist Party's vision of reshaping the society. During this period, society, the economy, law and order and knowledge, including essential knowledge about food, were systematically dismantled. The fresh market in the centre of Phnom Penh bustles with activity. Near a fruit stall, the black objects beside the apples were the primary and only source of protein for the malnourished population during the Khmer Rouge regime. Crispy, giant, edible spiders, some as large as the palm of your hand, include the entire body, legs and fur, all perfectly preserved. These arachnids are deep fried until they reach a satisfying crispness and they typically cost around 5,000 real or about one US dollar each, a relatively high price given the local cost of living. Nowadays, people enjoy consuming giant spiders as they're believed to have health benefits. During the Khmer Rouge era, however, the motivations for consuming these creatures were markedly different. In April 1975, Khmer Rouge forces led by Pol Pot seized Phnom Penh from the government of General Lon Nol, who was supported by the United States. Pol Pot's purpose was to create a new society by isolating the country, transitioning to a self-reliant socialist economy and returning it to an entirely agrarian nation. This included measures such as abolishing the banking system and currency, as well as closing hospitals and schools. People were forcibly used as laborers in the countryside, in accordance with the leader's ideology. They were provided with a few spoons full of porridge with a sprinkle of salt each day. Consequently, many became malnourished, emaciated, exhausted and ill, ultimately succumbing to starvation. Worms and insects, especially giant spiders, in the fields became a source of food for survival. Three decades after the Khmer Rouge, Cambodian society was on a slow path to recovery. Skyscrapers adorned the cityscape and a diverse array of restaurants ranging from one to five star establishments had emerged. Remarkably, the insects that once served as a means of survival during the Khmer Rouge era remain popular today. No longer confined to humble stalls, these insects have transcended into dishes featured in modern restaurants, skillfully crafted by professional chefs. Enter Bugs Cafe, an insect-themed restaurant in Siem Reap. Among its most sought-after dishes is the giant spider, transformed into a delectable tempura. The dish is so popular that they are often out of stock. Consequently, we have the opportunity to savour some smaller tempura spiders. <laughs> Try with a bit of sauce. Mm. Uh, this sauce and this one, if you if you like mango, or this is mayonnaise. Oh, I love mango. And to explain a bit more about the spider, because I see you're scared, um, the legs are just crunchy, as you can mm -hmm. see. Then this part in the middle is the thorax. It's only white meat inside. It's delicious. This part well, is very like close crab, to, right? to, to soft shell crab. And the small ball at the rear, you see, this is the, uh, this is the abdomen. Mm -hmm. It's a bit more controversial. Um, it's where the organ, so. it's a, it's a, it's where the organs are. So yeah. I would say it's closer to liver ah. for the texture. It's a bit bitter also. If you like liver, if you like this part. If you don't like liver, you can leave it aside. Well, I'm gonna try the. Ah, okay. Now it's like, it's like a soft shell crab. Is, yeah, very close to.
We also try spring rolls stuffed with ants, fried silkworms, and fried silkworms with fresh pepper, as well as papaya salad featuring fried scorpions. So all this is very good for health. It's good for the planet also, because uh, uh, if you compare with beef or chicken or traditional meat, you will need for the same amount of energy that you bring to the body. You will need less food, you will need less water, less ground, uh, you will uh, emit less greenhouse gas. So there are many, many good reasons to eat insects. In the beginning, People who are not used to it, people who's not, uh, who, who is not, uh, for whom it's not the culture to eat insects, they're scared, of course. But you see, this is why this place is clean. Uh, we try to, to make a nice presentation with the food. Uh, I explain a lot uh, why we cook it, how we cook it. And uh, when people feel comfortable, well, for most of the time, it's a, it's a good surprise. So uh, in the beginning, they're scared. And after, they love much and, and, they, and they really enjoy what they eat. The majority of the customers are Westerners unfamiliar with the practice of consuming insects resulting in a reaction that typically combines both excitement and fear. To deepen visitors' immersion into the insect world, the beverages offered here are crafted from worms and insects as well. We mix um, silkworms, moringa, you know this, uh, this plant? It's a local okay, plant, it's okay. very rich, very but good for health. But this dude, right? Yeah, absolutely. But okay. we, so there are some mixed in the, in the smoothie. Uh, moringa, spinach, banana, uh, and soy milk. It's very, very rich in protein. Uh, after a long day at the temples, it's perfect to, to get back some, some energy. Hmm. Refreshing. The beverage boasts a delightfully sweet and creamy flavor. To round off the meal, we indulge in a chocolate fondue, immersing silkworms, crickets and fruit into a pot of hot chocolate. The insect's greasy and crunchy texture harmonizes with the bitter sweetness of the chocolate and the tanginess of the fruit. Traditionally, insects have been a staple protein source for rural communities in tropical Asia, including Cambodia. Their significance grew during the Khmer Rouge era, and this restaurant endeavors to transform insect consumption from a mere survival necessity into a truly enjoyable experience. The culinary landscape of Cambodia bears the imprint of both Chinese and Indian influences, along with the culinary heritages of neighboring countries like Thailand and Vietnam, and the impact of French colonial rule. This rich amalgamation is evident in a diverse array of dishes, spanning from noodles and assorted curries to bread. Despite France granting independence to the colony over half a century ago, its legacy persists, leaving a lasting imprint on Cambodian cuisine. A substantial hard crust brown bread, familiar to many as a baguette, has become a staple in the daily diet of Cambodians. Locally referred to as nom pang, the term is derived from the French words le pain. In pre-Khmer Rouge Cambodia, each sub-district in the country boasted at least one bakery, where baguettes were expertly baked in large clay ovens fueled by intense heat from wood or charcoal. Regrettably, during the Khmer Rouge era, Western-influenced foods including this beloved baguette faced extinction. With the country's resurgence, traditional foods made a triumphant return. Today, a popular baguette presentation is known as Nom Pang Sak Koang in Khmer. This involves grilling the baguette until warm, stuffing it with grilled beef and pickled papaya, and complementing it with a savory dipping sauce. Nom Pang Sak Koang is a widely enjoyed culinary delight, commonly savoured from lunch through dinner. It is ubiquitous, found in street stalls and restaurants alike. Another culinary essential, deeply intertwined with Cambodian life in all circumstances, is rice porridge, known as bobo in Khmer. Rice porridge stood as a life-sustaining staple during periods of war and famine. Today, it takes the form of a bowl filled with rice, meat and vegetables. When the Khmer Rouge were in charge, however, porridge was minimalist fare, comprising rice water and countable grains of rice. Okay, 
Hello. The porridge vendor tells us that Cambodians originally ate dishes like fish, pork or chicken porridge. During the Khmer Rouge period, they also had porridge, but it was just plain white rice. The unsuccessful agricultural reforms of the Khmer Rouge resulted in dire food shortages. Many faced imprisonment, torture, murder and starvation. In those harrowing times, the prospect of a bowl filled with chicken or pork porridge was unthinkable. Merely receiving a few spoonsful of rice porridge daily was deemed a luxurious and cherished meal. Numerous stalls line the market, offering a variety of delights such as grilled chicken, grilled fish, fried dough snacks, buns filled with sweet bean paste, and sizable pods of preserved tamarind in a basin. We stop at a stall specializing in Cambodian rice noodles with fish curry, locally known as Nom Ban Jok Som Lo. These rice noodles are generously smothered in a fish curry and typically served with a medley of locally sourced fresh vegetables. During the Khmer Rouge era, many traditional dishes with their intricate ingredients and preparation methods vanished alongside countless lives. Lai San, a young Cambodian man with a law degree from a prestigious French university, dedicated several years to traversing the country to unearth traditional recipes from survivors of the Khmer Rouge. In our conversation with Lai San, the co-owner and general manager of Choir Angkor Restaurant, he emphasizes that Cambodians cherish a long-standing tradition of communal dining within the family. This practice explains why recipes are predominantly handed down through generations within families and are not widely documented. As a result, there's a notable scarcity of recorded Cambodian recipes, compelling him to seek out these culinary treasures from among the surviving elders. Lysan's quest for traditional recipes is rooted in part in a desire to showcase Cambodia as more than just the site of the genocide. He aims to convey to the world that Cambodia boasts a rich and intricate food culture. One dish that fills him with pride is Na Tang, or Khao Tang, featuring deep fried sticky rice served with a sauce. For the sauce, curry paste is stir fried in oil followed by additional crushed beans, fish sauce, palm sugar, minced pork and dry shrimp. The mixture is stirred thoroughly and thick coconut oil is added in the final step. The kaotang itself is crafted from steamed glutinous rice, molded into sheets and then dried, before undergoing the frying process. Uh, Lysan described how he initially collaborated with knowledgeable elders who knew the traditional recipes. Then he honed his skills through independent practice. Ultimately, he would present the dishes to the elders for their approval. Alternatively, he would offer them for tasting to Her Royal Highness Princess Norodombupa Devi, a Cambodian princess, to ensure the dishes adhered to the standards of traditional cuisine. If you want to see more great content from all over the world, please like the video, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. Thank you. We proceed to savour the next dish, a coconut milk curry featuring bamboo shoots and fish with chilli leaves. This is followed by stir-fried pork bones with curry paste. Our culinary journey continues with a delightful combination of watermelon and grilled fish, field crab curry and chicken curry with palm fruits. The similar geographic and climatic conditions result in Khmer cuisine sharing ingredients with its neighbour Thailand. The distinction, however, lies in the cooking techniques used. Khmer food distinguishes itself with a milder and smoother taste compared to the famous spiciness of Thai cuisine. There are traditional Khmer recipes that were commonly enjoyed by families. Meanwhile, in neighboring Thailand, dishes like these are part of their culinary tradition as well. For Cambodians, however, who have faced the most challenging times, these foods disappeared from their culinary landscape. Today, a new generation like Lysan has brought these dishes back to Cambodia, 
and is serving them according to the original recipes with carefully selected ingredients. The river flowing through the outskirts of Phnom Penh is vast, and the islands in the middle are rich in minerals deposited there by the flowing water. Corn, papaya, bananas, pumpkins and small eggplant trees are all bearing fruit. Chickens happily scavenge for seeds and insects in the vegetable plots. So it looks like you have everything you need here. Yes, have a lot of... Uh, we have so many vegetables from here. Mm. But some vegetables like onion, we don't have from here. And where you get the onion from? Um, abroad. These are us. Oh. Honestly, yes. Oh, okay. With some onion. So you try to use something that yes, grow here I, I try as to... much as possible? Yes, yes. Ah, okay. So some you have to import. I like it here, and you look very happy. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is you have to do to create a, a good food. Yeah. Why you wanna cook good food for Cambodia? Not only for Cambodians, hmm. for all of people that come to Kraya Uncle restaurant, I have confidence to 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 give them a very good uh, food. Hmm. Lai San's modest restaurant is garnering attention and acclaim. Renowned international media outlets, including CNN, have produced short documentaries spotlighting his endeavor to resurrect the authentic recipes. Additionally, he harbors plans to expand his business in the near future. The resurgence of traditional Khmer cuisine, which had disappeared under the Khmer Rouge, is becoming a noticeable trend in the country. Malice, a renowned restaurant which offers Khmer cuisine in the style of the royal palace, is constantly packed with people. As in many nations, traditional Cambodian cuisine is classified into distinct tiers, encompassing royal dishes, elite fare, and commoner's cuisine. Royal Magni is a, is a recipe from Royal Palace, actually. Okay. This is the one that has been gone, Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. This is forgotten, actually. Um, this one normally is just served in Royal Palace. Okay. Because our uh, master chef Lu Meng, his his mother is a uh, cook in in, in Royal Palace. Ah. That's why he pick up this this to put in the menu. Okay. And this is uh, actually is um, a crispy noodle, a glass noodle we uh, deep fry it. Okay. Some crispy, and we serve with um, uh, pork and uh, curry sauce. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I go for that one. You go to put it. On. Yeah, yeah. On the global food scene, dishes from diverse Asian cultures, including Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese and Thai cuisines, hold sway, while Cambodian food is conspicuously absent from the top rankings. In response to increasing interest from both locals and international tourists, the government is strategizing to propel Cambodian cuisine onto the global stage. <laughs> Chahe Sivlin, the president of the Cambodia Association of Travel Agents, told us that the Ministry of Tourism is confidently promoting Cambodian food globally, thanks to collaboration between the private sector and the government. Moreover, many tourists are eager to sample Cambodian cuisine. I don't know how many restaurants, but I want to open a good restaurants. I I'm not focused on big or small, mm -hmm. but I'm focused on only good service, mm -hmm. good food, and healthy vegetable from Cambodian farmer. Mm -hmm. Yes, to support them. Yeah, to support them. One last time, why is it important to cook a good food? Important to cook. Why you wanna cook a good food? I like it. The uh, customer to. Uh, I, I, I be happy. Yes, I, I be happy to see customer eat a good food. Mm. Yes. And you think Cambodian food will be? It's a good food for and and good for healthy. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you think it's gonna be known everywhere in the world? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you try. Yes, I'm, I will try as my as my best. <laughs> Cambodia is emerging from the shadows of war and genocide, and the city of Phnom Penh is experiencing continuing growth. 
A significant number of Cambodians, including those born abroad whose parents had fled the country and the tyranny of the Khmer Rouge, are gradually returning. The motivations for returning vary. Some are driven by a deep emotional connection to and yearning for their homeland, while others are committed to contributing to the country's progress. For some, the return to their hometown is fueled by nostalgia for the familiar flavors embedded in their memories and the challenge of introducing Khmer food to a global audience.